Good evening, St. Peter's Fireside. Good to see you. The Reverend Canon Dr. Alistair Stern told me I should introduce myself as, Hi, I'm Richard. I wrote a PhD on the census and I made a life mistake. Uh, but I'm not, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna say that, Alistair. I'm not gonna fall for it, I'm not gonna say it. What I will say is, hi, I'm Richard. I'm very nearly on the pastoral staff here. Well, we've arrived at Lent, finally. Ash Wednesday kicks off the 40-day season of Lent, which ends on Easter. Now, you might be asking, what is this Lent business? Isn't this the season where we give up chocolate? Last year, one of my best friends gave up nachos. He, he had a struggle with nachos. Um, that's, that's true. Uh, I gave up social media for Lent five years ago and never went back. Uh, I, once, I once heard someone say that they gave up Catholicism for Lent. Now, that's not very nice. But in all seriousness, Lent is serious business. In last week's loop, our beloved ministry coordinator, Heidi, said, Lent is a time where we ponder our mortality, brokenness, and sinfulness. We do this to be freshly reminded of our need for God's redemption and mercy. This seems a bit weightier than chocolate, social media, and even nachos. In the Sermon on the Mount, Christ gives us a roadmap on how to do Lent well. Along the way, he provides a window into God's character. We'll look at parts of Matthew chapter 6 that Preston read for us as we discern how to do Lent well. But before we do that, let's pray. Oh God, we thank you for your redemption and mercy. We ask for your strength to sustain each of us and St. Peter's fireside this Lenten season. Amen. In the Sermon on the Mount, Christ provides a vision of God's kingdom. And our reading is smack in the middle of this, the most famous sermon ever proclaimed. Now Christ drops the main point right away. In verse 1, we read, Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Three practices are used as examples, almsgiving, fasting, and prayer. So not just any practices, three that form the heart of Lenten practice. And there is a remarkable symmetry in the way Christ talks about them. The grammar is the same. Do this thing. Don't be showy about it. Here's how to do it well. Your father who is in secret will reward you. Notice the similarities. First, almsgiving. When you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret." and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Next, prayer. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you. Finally, fasting. And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head, wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your father who is in secret, and your father who sees in secret will reward you. We have here a vision of how to do Lent well. We don't practice Lent to be seen by others as holy and righteous. We don't announce our giving to the poor to score points with our friends. 
We don't moan and groan our fasting to feel more superior than the non-fasters among us. We don't virtue signal our righteousness through hyper-holy prayers that we make sure everyone hears. Speaking of prayer, did you catch that we skipped over the Lord's Prayer? There was a jump in the reading in Matthew 6. We skipped over the Lord's Prayer. It is here that Christ gives us an example of a prayer focused on God, not us. He gives us the Our Father, a prayer we here at St. Peter's send to God each Sunday. But what if Christ did give us a self-centered prayer? I think it would go something like this. Myself, you are sacred, your desires fulfilled, your will be done. On earth, for nowhere else really matters. Give me all that I want and hope that others forgive me whether I forgive them or not. Give me the guts to give in to my temptations and deliver me from those who demand I be better. <laughs> I, I hope this self-centered prayer makes you feel a bit uneasy. Our, I think our unease comes from the gap between this prayer and the Lord's Prayer. The latter prayer gives adoration and prays to God, and then asks him for mercy and forgiveness. The self-centered prayer gives adoration to the self and closes the door on mercy and forgiveness to others. So Lent exposes one of the great truths of life. It's not about you. It's not about me. But that is a truth that sits comfortably with another truth that does have to do with you and me. Why do we give alms and fast and pray? To draw close to God through sharing in the life of Christ. And the more closely we draw to God through Christ, the more we share our life with others. Some of you know this, but many might not. I live right next door to the Naz. Many of you might not know this, but the neighborhood is home to various sex workers, especially on weekend nights. A few years back, my neighbor knocked on the door one snowy winter morning. She told me there was a sex worker in pretty rough shape down stairs by our front door, front door that leads outside the building to Kingsway. As I headed out, I literally had to step over her to leave. And I'm using literally correctly in that I literally did have to step over. It's a narrow doorway. Um, she was shivering uncontrollably, blue lips, so clearly looking back on it, she has hypothermic. She had short sleeve, short skirt, and heels. Snow was still falling outside that morning. My neighbor not only invited this sex worker into our building, not only called and paid for a cab, but enveloped her in a big, beautiful, warm blanket. In fact, her nicest blanket, her and her family's nicest blanket. I'll never forget that blanket, just the glance walking over, uh, stepping over her. My neighbor let her keep that blanket. Now, I'd like to think I would have done something similar, but I'm not sure that I would have. I'm really not sure. By the way, my neighbor is an atheist, but that didn't stop me from feeling the presence of God more powerfully than all but a handful of times in my life. God was there because this was an act of pure goodness and mercy. And where you find the good and merciful, you find God. Doesn't matter the vessel he uses. It could be Mother Teresa. It could be my neighbor. If you draw close to God through Christ, you open yourself up to sharing his goodness and truth and beauty with others. You could say the point of life is it's not about you, it's about loving God and through him, your neighbor. I tell this story because I want to co connect Lent to God's character. Indeed, Christ himself does so right before our passage. The very end of chapter 5 closes with a command from Christ, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. He says this right before he commands us not to practice showy righteousness. We've reached a pivot in Christ's sermon. 
commands to us take up a bulk of the first part of the sermon, most of chapter 5. Then a shift, the end of the chapter. God is perfect. Be like him. Here's how. Don't be showy with your righteousness. Why this emphasis? Because our righteousness isn't wholly or even mostly ours. It's God working through us. There's a strong repetition in this packet passage on giving alms, praying, and fasting in secret. And the Father sees in secret, and he will reward you. These are all repeated multiple times, but what do they mean? The last verses of our reading provide the key. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Christ is asking us a question. Where is your heart? Is it in heaven? Because that's where God is. Or is it here? Because God isn't in your phone or in that pleasurable meal or new sweater or in social acceptance or God forbid the metaverse. These perish, they're fickle. They can be stolen, they can be taken away. I think verse 21 is the heart of the Sermon on the Mount. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. In the Beatitudes, we read that the poor in spirit and those who are persecuted gain the kingdom of heaven. The pure in heart see God. Christ's command not to be angry only makes sense if there is a God in heaven whom this anger agrees. You can read the Sermon on the Mount as a window into God's character. Next time you read that sermon, ask yourself, what does this say about God? There's also the discussion of reward that is repeated. Do these in secret and God will reward you. I think Christ is telling us that the riches of God vastly outweigh any rewards given by showy righteousness. Validation and social standing are nice, but they're not comparable to what God in heaven can offer. Remember, God's gifts aren't fickle, they don't expire. The next passages of Christ's sermon are also relevant here. These are the passages immediately after the ones that Preston read. After hearing about treasures in heaven, we hear that we can't serve God and mammon, that is, money and possessions. There are few better representatives of earthly treasures than money and possessions. And if you put your heart in them, you can't put it in God. We next read the famous, don't be anxious of your life passage, one that has been deeply meaningful to me in my life. Here again is a link to treasures in heaven. If you put your heart with God in heaven, you're not to worry about food and clothing and shelter. Notice Christ asks us rhetorically, is not life more than these? True life is greater than the three most important and fundamental things for earthly survival. So Christ is telling us that true life is found with your Father in heaven. Now, I need to make an important point here. This is not world-denying stuff. It's world-transforming stuff. It's kingdom of God stuff. By placing our hearts with God in Christ, we are inwardly transformed. And a big part of that transformation changes our outward focus towards others and towards creation. One of the great aspects of the Christian contemplative tradition is training yourself to be pure in heart that you might see God. You power through or see past custom and habit and your selfish ego to see God and his goodness working in others in creation. I highly recommend it. It's something that's really helped change my life and my faith. But all this to say, when you lay your, up for yourselves treasures in heaven, you help usher in God's kingdom here on earth. And that's pretty radical if you think about it. 
by focusing on the next stage, by seeing through the eyes of eternity, you help transform this one. By seeing through the eyes of eternity, you actually help transform this one. Which brings us back to Lent. I've been drawing a line between how to practice almsgiving, prayer, and fasting, and what that says about God. We practice Lent in secret, so to speak, because it draws us closer to God. And we can only draw close to God in humility, asking for mercy and forgiveness. And he is merciful and just to forgive us our sins. The mid-20th century British poet Philip Larkin closes his poem Afternoons with this remarkable verse. Something is pushing them to the side of their own lives. Something is pushing them to the side of their own lives. Do you feel you've been pushed to the side of your own life? If so, what is this something that is pushing you? I suspect for many of us, I know it is for me, it's related to screens. But it could be any number of things. The key point is don't be a spectator in your own life. This Lenten season, I encourage you to fast from what is pushing you to the side of your own life. Because whatever that is, it's pushing you away from God. It's pushing you away from Christ, away from the center of your true life. Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, and you'll find God waiting to share his life with you for the good of his kingdom. Amen.